important to raise uh, this unintended consequence of uh, due, of the drug problem. Uh, and uh, as I was saying, unfortunately and sadly, uh, drugs continue to kill. Uh, in uh, the latest World Drug Report, it reported that in 2019, almost 500,000 uh, drug-related uh, deaths over the world. And this is represent an increase compared to uh, data from 10 years ago, so uh, some 17% increase. Therefore, it's crucial that we work together and focus on saving lives. And this is why uh, there is an international drug policy uh, system with uh, the Commission on Narcotic Drug that I've mentioned before, which is the governing body for UNODC. And it meets every year in March uh, to review the world drug problem and decide on drug policies within the framework of the UN drug control conventions. Uh, my unit has been working uh, for uh, many years uh, uh, with the, our main umbrella organization, which is the Vienna NGO Committee, to facilitate civil society participation and to ensure that the voice of, uh, of civil society is heard. The active engagement of, uh, of the ex civil society experts around the world has become a normal part of the life of CNV in all in the in the latest year, and it presents an opportunity for civil society to meet with senior government officials and policymakers, and vice versa for civil society to uh, really provide this. Uh, essential and pivotal wor work to promote more humane health and right-based approach to uh, the, the drug policy. And also to, to, to bring the ears and the eyes of what's happening in the ground, how, uh, how people do suffer and need uh, the, the, the help of, of governments. So, um, and uh, yes, maybe a little thing to mention that we have uh, also published a guide uh, of, for NGOs um, on the 2030 agenda and uh, the connection uh, with the 2019 ministerial uh, declaration on drugs, which is the latest policy uh, work that is uh, currently under review by the Commission on Narcotic Drug and will be um, discussed, uh, uh, reviewed also in 2014. On COVID, as I mentioned, there was, of course, a little positive things, but we have all uh, been impacted and suffered the, all the consequence on society, the increase of inequality, poverty, mental health conditions, particularly for already vulnerable population. Uh, and all this, uh, even if it hasn't been uh, accurately yet measured, represent a risk factor that is likely to, to, to show that the there was a direct consequences with the increase of drug uh, use and the increase of uh, drug deaths that I was mentioning earlier. In fact, speaking to yesterday to a friend of mine who lost, unfortunately, her son uh, last year, she was explaining to me how difficult it was during COVID time to be able to have this face-to-face -face counseling and how the fact of medical and psychological services uh, for, for drug use disorders were disrupted, reduced, uh, this uh, left her and obviously uh, her, uh, having to deal with her son who, who, who was on drugs uh, in a very, very difficult position. So to conclude, I would like also to refer another goal, uh, which is very important for you, I know you see uh, the, the goal 17, which is uh, meant to uh, strengthen the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development. And this is 
a role which is at the heart of UNODC and the civil society unit in particular, uh, as we support and facilitate multi-stakeholder partnership in all the area under our mandate. So as this partnership is needed more than ever in difficult times now that the world is uh, divided between COVID and conflicts, I really look forward to hear from all the panelists and to discuss how uh, we can further strengthen our partnership. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marella, for your thoughtful and comprehensive remarks. There's just so much to reflect on there, and I really appreciate it. Perhaps just to echo one of your comments, which I completely agree with around the ways in which civil society has made strides and increased our presence in the area of drug policy, in particular, thinking about the Commission on Narcotic Drugs. I know for me, as chair of the New York NGOC, it feels like there's ever increasing opportunities for ourselves and our sister committee to make selections for civil society speakers, involvements in working groups, technical consultations. There's always new ways that civil society can be engaged. So we're thankful to the civil society unit for the work in that regard as well, and, and look forward to continuing to strengthen our partnerships um, with the goal of ever increasing civil society engagement. Thanks so much, Marella. Much appreciated. So allow me next uh, to introduce Jamie Bridge, chair of the Vienna NGOC, uh, Vienna NGO Committee on Drugs. Our committees, as mentioned, work closely together, and it's always a joy to work with Jamie and, as ever, to partner on this specific event as well. So I'll allow Jamie to take the floor. Go ahead, Jamie. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nasli. And uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, completely echo everything that Nasli and Marella have said already. So just a few words from us at the Vienna NGO Committee on Drugs. Um, as Nasli said, we, we work closely with the Civil Society Unit and with the New York Committee as well. And really our goal is to provide that link between civil society and the UN processes on drugs. And especially as, as Nasli mentioned, the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, which happens in Vienna, hence our committee's name. Uh, but essentially we are a network. Uh, we have uh, nearly 400 members from all around the world. Um, and what we do as the NGO committee is we, we advocate uh, on your behalf for civil society space here in Vienna, um, and also for kind of meaningful partnerships with the member states and with the UN agencies. And, and as has been mentioned, that, that we've had a lot of success, uh, you know, collectively in recent years and I, I do I really think that civil society space in these drugs debates is uh, is as strong as it's ever been at the moment which is fantastic um, but also what we do uh, is we make sure that we provide support and information to NGOs on how they can use that space and how to make the best of that space and to use that space for your own advocacy and your own work linked as we've talked about to COVID to the 2030 agenda and obviously to drugs we also have an NGO marketplace available. I'll, um, I'll put the link in the chat uh, in a moment. And that really is a platform for all civil society to share their work, uh, to share their contacts. So if you're looking for an NGO that's working on drug prevention in Africa, you can use the marketplace to find potential partners and, and allies and colleagues in that way. Um, we're obviously delighted to be co-hosting this event and uh, thanks especially to, um, to Nasli and Mirella, but also to Sarah Perker, who's the project officer at the Vienna NGO Committee on Drugs, who's really kind of led on the logistics and, and as always, I don't know what we do without her. So thank you, Sarah, uh, working behind the scenes on this. Um, and just before, before I finish, just I want to mention um, two recent initiatives that we've worked uh, on with UNODC and, and, and with other partners. We've been creating these working groups focused on different regions around the world uh, in recent years, really aiming to improve engagement uh, at, at, the, uh, at the CND and at, you know, in the UN processes. And most recently, these working groups uh, in Africa and in Asia have created civil society common positions. They've held consultations, uh, meetings, different surveys, and they've created these common positions which are designed to um, outline the view of civil society in most parts of the world and support and inform the member states as we go into processes such as the Commission on Narcotic Drugs itself. Uh, again, I'll put the links in the chat for anyone that might be interested in seeing those documents and we hope that there'll be more to come as well. Um, and so it just leaves me to say a huge thank you to our speakers today uh, who have applied to speak at this event. 
Um, and also particularly to thank all of those who applied and weren't selected. We had, I think, Nasli, more than 60 applications to speak at this event, which is fantastic. And it goes to show the, you know, the demand that is there for, for this kind of space. Um, so thank you to everyone who applied. And uh, yeah, I, I, hope, um, I hope you really gained something from this session. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jamie. Really great to hear from you. And I particularly appreciate you drawing folks' attention to both the Africa and Asia Pacific common positions, which of course came out of the working groups that had been convened by the VNGOC, but not at, at all limited to VNGOC members. So I think those are really positive experiences. And I'll just mention briefly um, that building upon those positive experiences, both the New York NGOC and the VNGOC together in June of last year launched a new working group for NGOs in Latin America with the same idea of coming together to discuss barriers to engagement and identify new opportunities, leaving it up to them whether they would like to establish a new regional society common position or some other way of moving ahead. So I mentioned this as well just to say that it's not limited to members of the New York NGOC or VNGOC and membership is still open. So if you are an NGO working in Latin America and you're interested in being part of this ad hoc working group convened by both our committees, we would, we would love to have you. And I believe that Sarah will put her email address uh, into the chat for those that might be interested. It's just a short plug for that building off of Jamie's remarks. Thank you so much. So now having heard from both of our opening remarks, our speakers delivering opening remarks, I'm really excited to introduce our first civil society speaker. Stacey Dorley Jones is the Chief Executive Officer and Founder of STAN, which stands for Social Transformation Action Defined. It is a nonprofit organization established in 2018 in South Africa with a specific focus in the field of substance use disorders, gender-based violence, and vulnerable key population groups. Today, Stacey will be speaking about addressing the barriers of linkage to comprehensive health, including HIV, as well as sexual and reproductive health care services for specifically women who use drugs in the rural regions of the Cape Winelands, South Africa. Really looking forward to your remarks, Stacey. You have the floor. Thank you so much, Nasli, and, um, and, and a very special thank you to, to Jamie and um, Mirella and to Sarah for organizing this event. Um, and good afternoon to all wonderful guests here this afternoon. Um, I feel very privileged to be able to speak on this platform. I'm going to try to keep it short. Um, I'm, I'm not known for that. So I've put a little presentation together just to keep me on track. Um, if I may just share it and um, just go through the key points. I'll try to keep it short and um, allow for, for questions. Okay. Um, right. So I... Um, oops. Okay. Right. So essentially, I'm speaking to you this afternoon around a project that has been um, well, was started in twenty, actually way back in 2021, when we were um, funded by the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. And um, through that project, we actually um, implemented the project that I'm going to speak about today, which is essentially linking vulnerable women in rural regions to HIV testing, sexual reproductive health care, um, and, and um, HIV testing. So before I start anything, I think it's really important. This is a picture. It's the only picture I'm going to show you. But this picture is the very first in a rural region where there is a combined woman who used drugs and professional department of healthcare, doctors, nurses, psychiatrists, et cetera, in one room. And I think honestly and truly, that is a magnitude of a step um, particularly for rural regions. Um, a little bit more on that later, but essentially this, the, the background to this project was obviously, um, you know, to improve access to HIV testing and, and care, increase awareness on the harm reduction principles. And by that I'm talking about the humane, the humane treatment and understanding the person behind the drug 
and being sensitive to that um, rather than you know chasing them away uh, from healthcare facilities. So we had to uh, demonstrate a pilot project um, where we capacitated community healthcare workers on um, non-stigmatizing and um, non-discriminatory practices when dealing with this uh, vulnerable key population group. And within that, um, we then were able to, to develop um, or formulate community advisory groups of women who use drugs that we had really in-depth uh, conversations with where they gave us the barriers to their treatment of access to healthcare. And this was quite an incredible outcome. Um, the key outcomes of that were that was stigma and discrimination. Uh, particularly in these rural regions, they are left to, um, you know, uh, religious biases, um, intergenerational stigma, et cetera. And so what we did was we took those barriers to healthcare and we understood from the woman that they wanted to, to access healthcare away from um, their communities where they're not stigmatized. And out of that um, came a very, very, very um, big, much bigger project, which we've now taken on over two years, which is essentially link, you know, addressing those barriers that were brought up in the UNODC project. And um, within that, we needed to develop networks um, of women who use drugs, capacitate them, and assist them in linkage to healthcare, but also in organizing themselves and providing a voice and also being able to speak um, where they've never spoken before in terms of government uh, platforms, um, you know, with policymakers, et cetera. So that was a really, really big step um, for them. And then another one of the big aspects was the sensitization uh, training and capacitation with law enforcement, healthcare services, and social welfare services. And this, I, I tell you, I'm astounded every single time we look at the results of those sensitization trainings where we actually bring those network leads into the capacitation sessions where they can have healthy dialogue with the various sectors. And it was incredible because it was a mutual training session, actually, between the women and the sectors. And I think they learned a significant amount, uh, you know, from each other in terms of moving forward um, to such an extent that we've been asked by the Department of Health to, um, you know, to come back and please provide more sensitization uh, training for healthcare services which you know, um, is, a, is a big win in itself. We also try to move the woman out of their economic um, um, you know, GBV bondage by linking them to small grant opportunities and that, that we did through um, an organization uh, in South Africa called Sandput, South African Network of People Who Use Drugs. They significantly assisted us in um, understanding better um, you know, the, the, the humane aspect and the principles of, of harm reduction. And I'm not talking about needle syringe programs or anything. I'm, I'm talking about the principles of harm reduction. Um, so ultimately, we will be developing a scalable model by the end of this year. It's now ro rolling out into a second region. Um, and I'm just going to end off on the findings and recommendations. I'm looking, my time is almost up. And um, essentially, it is the ongoing capacitation of women who use drugs um, in terms of more entrepreneurial skills, self-sustainability, because what happens is they, it, it uh, improves their, their lifestyle. They, they form a buddy system. They link other women. They find them in the community. They link them to healthcare, And they're really diligent about this ongoing engagement with, between stakeholders and, and, and the woman that fosters um, um, you know, much healthier ways of communication. 
and there needs to be far more um, gender centric uh, facilities available for women who use drugs in these regions um, where the GBV is, is significantly high. We've also advocated for mobile clinic services to go out to the more um, rural farm, farmland regions. And obviously more ongoing uh, um, women out, you know, specifically for women who use drugs outreach campaigns where they're not afraid um, to access this treatment. And um, that a more robust program is ultimately implemented throughout the rural region to tackle all of these issues. Um, very short time to put this together, but um, gosh, I'd love to speak far more. But that was essentially um, and is essentially the project we are busy embarking on. So thank you very, very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Stacey. Really appreciate your presentation. Such an incredible example that really showcases, I think, many of the themes that we are trying to bring forward today. Um, certainly the idea of partnerships, it's evident that strong partnerships were crucial to the success, including from the beginning with UNODC's involvement. Um, and of course, I think the, the meaningful involvement of people who use drugs is really showcased as well, rather than in, in some contexts as a more tokenistic way of engaging key population groups. But it sounds like your project went way beyond that. Um, and the last comment I'll just make reflecting on yours is that, of course, the, the issue of stigma, it, it's interesting that you raised that because that has in recent years been a, a new focus of the international community, thinking about Commission on Narcotic Drugs Resolutions for the first time on stigmatizing attitudes a few years back and then on social marginalization. So I think certainly those, those same challenges that were raised in your community are irrelevant across the world and something that the international community has been working to address as well. So really grateful to you for bringing up all those excellent points. Thank you so much, Stacey. So allow me next to introduce our second civil society speaker today, who is Ernesto Cortez, the executive director of the Costa Rican Association on Drug Studies and Interventions, which is a nonprofit organization in Costa Rica made up of a team of professionals from the areas of social sciences, health, law, education and the arts, as well as activists and other people interested in transforming drug policies towards a more humane rights, a human rights approach, um, especially those that are most affected by the war on drugs, such as drug users and small producers or sellers. I would be remiss not to also mention how fortunate I am that Ernesto is also vice chair of the New York NGO Committee on Drugs, although of course he's speaking with a different hat on today. And um, I'll share as well that Ernesto, I understand, will be speaking about the crisis generated by the COVID-19 pandemic, which has exasperated existing situations of criminalization, stigma, discrimination towards people who use drugs, as well as offer some recommendations for addressing these challenges. So looking forward to your remarks, Ernesto. You have the floor. Thanks, Nasli. And hello to everyone. Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are right now. So, um, well, I'm Ernesto Cortez. I'm from Costa Rica. I'm a drug user activist. I'm, besides my home country civil society organization, ASAID, Costa Rican Association on Drug Studies and Intervention. I'm also a member of the Latin American Network of People Who Use Drugs, LAMPUT. Um, in this presentation, I, I wanted to have a, a slides, but my computer is not working. so. I'm just gonna go on the floor and I'll just share the link there from, from where we published. Everything's in Spanish though, but we'll, we'll get some funding later this year to translate. So um, first of all, I wanted to thank all of you for this space. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks to the NGO committee, Mirella, Jamie, Stacy for your presentation and everyone else. You know, I wanted to address exactly what we did. Now, Lamput right now, uh, this, this network we're working with, uh, we're part of a global fund grant. You know, so we're working with ten, nine other regional networks of people living with HIV and key populations. And in this uh, context, we uh, write, wrote down some recommendations for governments and civil society organizations regarding how we should address COVID-19 response towards people who use drugs. So. Definitely, we have to think that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic made a, generated a crisis that exacerbated the existing situation of criminalization and stigma and discrimination toward people who use drugs. So I'm going to address a lot about stigma and discrimination because I, I do think in criminalization that it's the, the worst 
negative effect that prohibition brings, no further worse than drugs itself. So uh, COVID-19 response really affected uh, us as people who use drugs, no quarantine, isolations, these uh, curfews imposed by governments encourage police and military presence and repressions in our streets, you know, as well as exclusion from healthcare services and social benefits. Many people know that from what happened with the, the harm reduction responses in many countries, how the access to naloxone or to uh, opioids, you know, substitution stop. We don't, we don't have as much opioid use or injecting drug use in Latin America, but it definitely affected uh, mainly vulnerable populations, mainly young people, women, LGBTQI, uh, T communities, sex workers, and definitely incarcerated peoples. Uh, also, because we couldn't get to get to to health services, and most of these health services were only dedicated to COVID nineteen response. You know, but also affected the illicit drug market, reducing availability of some substances, price increases, you know, and diminishing quality of many of these substances. So what we wrote down and what we what we thought at Lamput with collaboration of my local organization, ASAID, it's that COVID-19 is definitely an occasion to rethink drug policies, you know, to understand the intersectionality between populations. You know, there's something that, it's, uh, that we see a lot working mainly with sex workers, trans women and young gay men is that they use a lot of drugs. You know, and they in, in many um, health services or even you know, I don't know social services don't recognize that and stigmatize and discriminate people you now limiting their access to essential medicines or antiretrovirals for example. So this affects our human rights, our health care and social inclusion. And regarding to the sustainable development goals you know, definitely has to deal with goal three of the good health and well-being. Goal five, gender and equality. Goal eight, regarding decent work and economic growth. Goal 16, that it's just justice, peace, and strong institutions. And as Mirella said in the beginning, goal 17, no partnership with form the other goals. There we need to include everyone and people who use drugs are we really are really important in this in this context. So we we came up with three general recommendations regarding how to deal with this pandemic, because I also think that it's not the first pandemic we're gonna live in our lifetime. Now. So for the next ones, there's also a, a pandemic treaty coming up. Now there's also all this discussion regarding how we should deal with vulnerable populations and criminalize and stigmatize populations. So the first one, the first recommendation definitely is to end criminalization and arbitrary detentions towards people who use drugs. You know, uh, police, military, and security and justice agencies should focus on protecting health and reducing the risk to uh, to get COVID-19, example, or other sickness, and focus on integration, treatment, and harm reduction policies instead of repression and incarceration. So uh, this first one, you know, we thought that it could come up generating protocols, guidelines, directives on how the police should act. Many countries, people, well, even us as drug users don't know how to deal with police and police either don't know how to deal with us. So it's based on this statement, criminalization and repression. We also should provide basic information for police on how to approach these protocols, you know, how to, um, instead of repression, uh, leading people towards health services, harm reduction services. I mean, even though in Latin America, we don't, we don't uh, talk much about harm reduction, you know, mainly because we don't inject and there's no much obvious way. This injection drug use is not really common. So there's not much talk about harm reduction. That's why we have been focusing more on stigma and discrimination to deal with this. Also, we have to disseminate information for people who use drugs on how to avoid to be criminalized, you know, creating safe spaces for people who use drugs. Many young people cannot use drugs in their, in their homes, in their in places, so they have to go out. So creating these safe spaces or drug user rooms or, or similar, you know, definitely uh, provides um, this protection for people who use drugs. And definitely one of the issues it's to prompt, uh, to respond to with uh, medical and psychological um, services. One thing we saw is how this pandemic affected people who could use drugs at their places for, or their house. You know? uh, some of them have to stop using 
so what to do with this population you know what health uh, and mainly mental health services were not provided anyway so um the second um recommendation is we um, tell we told to address the needs and conditions of most vulnerable socially and economically populations, especially those who had drug use problems, uh, homeless people, you know, incarcerated people. You know, this was the most affected population. In fact, uh, thinking about homeless people, we saw in many countries, at least here in Costa Rica, the government putting up uh, shelters, you know, but they were most temporarily shelters. So they have a place to stay for five, six months, you know, and they then was, they were just kicked out going again to the streets you know, with no other protection. So the first thing is that we have to declare harm reduction programs as life saving services, essential services in, in every country. This is needed you now. Uh, and to reorganize those who work in these services as key um, personnel, health personnel, as many countries did during the pandemic. You know, many countries even closed their harm reduction services. So we also have to develop and implement safety and hygiene protocols for people in these conditions. Uh, I'm also um, a family of an incarcerated person, and so I got in first hand from my brother uh, what happened inside prisons and how they didn't get mo anything, no alcohol. They didn't give alcohol to incarcerated population because they said they were going to drink it, you no, know, or they just get some a soap or some water, you no. Know, so definitely. Uh, this hygiene protocol should be implemented and should be supervised in these spaces. And also to reduce prison population. You know, it's, it's, it's a virus that just flows around there. So if you have many people crowded in one space, it definitely increases the, the risk. So I could tell my brother said everybody got sick, but we didn't get any medical attention. So we didn't know that we got COVID or we, if we didn't. No, but I, I was sure that everyone was sick there. So just to, to go further, no, the third one, it's to provide information on harm reduction approach for people who use drugs. And I wanted to show that, but I cannot right now, but I'll send the link of some infographics in Spanish we did for people who use drugs in Latin America, because definitely due to stigma and discrimination um, and criminalization, we have been invisible and we were not taken in account in the whole COVID-19 response. So this, this, this information was focused mainly on, on how to reduce the risk of getting COVID-19, mainly not uh, asking or, or, or putting out information not to share your drinks or your joints or your, any way uh, your, you use substances, try to use by yourself, don't use alone. You know? Also, when you go and buy drugs, you know, try to uh, disinfect the bag or whatever you get, you know, but also don't um, try to not to, to get together too much. You know, at the end we saw mainly for young people, you know, how difficult it was being to stay so, so much time at home. You know? So we, you have all these private parties or illegal parties, if you could say. You know? So how to avoid that and how to, to address that. You know? But also, uh, thinking on how to uh, deal with yourself when you're a drug user, or if you don't want to use, or if you keep using alone in your place, you know. So try to prepare yourself, prepare your mind, uh, do some exercise, help, keep healthy, you know, eat well, and all that stuff. Um, but at the end, I'll I'll share the link because I, I wanted to show all this this um, infographics, you know. Uh, what I wanted to say is all these recommendations came up, as I said in the beginning, with the support of other key population networks and, and, and people living with HIV networks and civil society organizations. And we have been trying to work with governments towards that. And we have definitely seen some, some work and some push uh, in that way. At least here in Costa Rica, we have been working really close, mainly with health uh, care organizations and uh, institutions dealing with HIV. You know, it's, it's really interesting for us as drug users how the HIV response, it's more uh, focused or more, how can I say, interested in supporting us as key populations 
rather than drug policy institutions. You know, it's really it has been really difficult to um, address you know, and to work together with institutions that would deal more with drug policy. Because at the end, the only way to to develop or put forward these recommendations is to work closely with government institutions. Uh, civil society partnership and definitely support from private ent entities and definitely with international agencies like United Nations and UNODC and Vienna NGO Committee and New York NGO Committee. So thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you so much, Ernesto. Really appreciate your presentation today. I think you also did an excellent job of showcasing the importance of, of strong partnerships across different sectors, and as well as really the meaningful involvement of people who use drugs. Um, and involvement is a is not an appropriate word because really it's the leadership of people who use drugs um, creating those recommendations that you outlined, um, all of which I thought were excellent. And, and in fact, the, the first recommendation around decrim expansion of harm reduction services, I, I would be uh, um, inclined to say that the entire UN system, all 31 UN agencies would be supporting those recommendations, thinking back to our common position on drugs, which did include those points. And I also really appreciated your recognition really of intersectionality, thinking about other populations like those that are incarcerated. Um, and you also mentioned those with different sexual orientations, gender backgrounds. Um, so really appreciate you bringing those perspectives today, Ernesto. Thank you so much for joining us. So I'm pleased now to present our third civil society speaker for today, which is Chinea Nwadekiksi Shpeshuba, is a criminologist and a lecturer in the Faculty of Social Sciences, Department of Sociology at Namdi Azikwi University in Nigeria. She is joining us on behalf of the Center for Innovation and Pragmatic Development Initiative in Nigeria, also known as CIPDI. Um, which is an organization that deploys customized innovative approaches to solve problems, build communities, develop and equip individuals to transform their environment and circumstances. CIPDI is currently working with several secondary schools in Nigeria to develop drug awareness programs. So today, Chinea will be speaking about the significant role of civil society organizations in the effective functioning of social systems, and will provide some practical examples of the many critical roles that civil society organizations have played in managing societal challenges. So uh, Chinea, you have the floor. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Mariela. I hope I'm so nice with that, hopefully. Um, thank you very much, Jamie. The organizers of this uh, forum. And thank you to the panelists, the speakers. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Ernesto. And thank you to all our guests participated in this today. Um, it's good afternoon here in Nigeria. Uh, good afternoon. As uh, Marella already introduced me, I will be representing a Center for Innovation and Pragmatic Development Initiative. I would like to join the current discourse, which is on the central role of civil society in drug policies, COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, achieving the 2030 agenda. It's important for us to note that the role of civil society in the effective functioning of the social system cannot be overemphasized. That being said, in Nigeria here, it's important for us to note that the civil society are regarded as the watchdog of the society. They perform both manifest and latent uh, function, such as uh, providing specialized uh, information, uh, they provide advice, uh, they engage in lobbying efforts in order to ensure public accountability, in order to ensure um, sustenance of social order in order to ensure social development and they do this through various uh, forms of uh, media outlets uh, that being said however the role of civil society organization in job policy in nigeria has not gained the significant uh, recognition it needs especially in this uh, extent day uh, that being said hence this uh, singular fact undermines the critical role that uh, civil organizations, uh, civil society can play mm. in terms of uh, helping the global health organization combat the challenges that are facing drug uh, policy, especially within the ambit of uh, international drug 
uh, joint drug law policy, which is uh, committed to uh, prevention of uh, drug abuse, treatment of uh, drug misuse disorder, um, the control, the access and accessibility to these uh, substances. Like in Nigeria, we have a lot, a lot of young people abuse um, illicit drug that is known as a tramadol. And there's another drug that is known as um, codeine. It's actually illicit, but the way they abuse it, it's now considered an illicit drug. So before you get it in Nigeria now, you need to get the proper prescription for it so that they will make sure you're not abusing this drug. And that being said, the this um, international joint uh, drug uh, policy, they also involve in stuff like um, law enforcement, um, especially when it comes to drug-related crimes. Uh, they also are involved in uh, drug and the human rights issues. Uh, that being said, there is this uh, singular assumption that most people have that it is exclusively the duty of global health organizations to coordinate and uh, it's their responsibility to coordinate everything that has to do with drug policy and administration. But I will give an instance in Nigeria where uh, to show the critical role that civil society can play in drug administration and uh, drug policy. Uh, in Nigeria, during the COVID-19 period, uh, it wasn't very easy for the government to reach everywhere. So most, uh, it was the civil society that was able to reach those places the government could not reach. They were able to provide uh, nose masks, face masks. They were able to provide hand sanitizers. They were able to provide hand gloves. They cleaned up uh, public places. They provide waste baskets to make sure that they could tell the spread of this uh, COVID-19 virus at its peak in Nigeria. They were also able to go to rural places, uh, to the market places, talk to rural women, talk to the youths because it became a problem between a uh, security agency trying to enforce the guidelines for COVID-19. Most uh, people started uh, rebelling and it became violent between the law enforcement agencies and the youths and the general public. So this civil society came in to make sure that they sustained this social order by enlightening the public the importance of them cooperating with the government in order to curtail the spread of this COVID-19. Because in Nigeria here, most people believe because we have a, a lot of corruption issues going on that it might have to do with that. It's not really what they say. But with the help of this uh, civil society, people start understanding that is actually for everyone's good that we adhere to the guidelines that are provided. Having given this instance uh, to highlight the important role the civil society played, and during the COVID-19 period, we have issues of uh, young people, um, a lot of poor families that work and eat daily. They call them daily pay minimum. Uh, they perform this minimum level. So without them working daily, they can't feed. So most of them got uh, depressed and frustrated, and they were involved in uh, all sorts of drugs in order to help them cope with the um, with the whole uh, COVID-19 effect. So the civil society have been trying after them to try to curtail the effects that this COVID-19 has brought, it has made more youth in Nigeria to be involved in drug abuse of different forms, not just the youth. Sometimes you find even a frustrated uh, families that get very much involved in this drug use. So if this could be replicated in times and in terms of uh, the collaboration uh, of civil society and world health uh, and their health, um, global health organizations, if they can reflect this, uh, it will show the critical role that uh, civil society can perform in order to help attain the uh, objective of the sustainable development goals like uh, the number three, which is good health and uh, well-being, as well as uh, number 16, which is peace, justice, and a strong institution. So that being said, I want to go ahead and uh, state some of the recommendations I have. Um, one, it's... It's, there is need to improve the viability of this uh, civil society in Nigeria. Uh, 
they can do this through collaboration of uh, through, co through collaborative uh, social economic uh, programs. They can do this by governments um, investing or financially aiding a uh, civil society, as well as uh, they could even give more responsibilities to the civil society so that they can function effectively. Then um, the number two recommendation I have is that uh, it, is, it is important, there is need for civil society to liaise and work with our security organizations. For example, in Nigeria, we have the Nigerian Drug Law Enforcement Agency. They can collaborate with them. They can collaborate with the Nigerian police force as well. They can collaborate with the Nigerian Immigration Services. And uh, if this is done, I think it will prove out the needed solution to this uh, issue at hand. So I want to keep it brief and short. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Thank you so much, Shania, for your excellent remarks. So useful. I really appreciate you highlighting truly the, the need and the importance of civil society engagement, this idea that civil society is on the ground, has access to spaces that policymakers, international organizations, those researchers, folks that we can sometimes think about as being in the ivory tower rather than actually on the ground seeing what is happening. And, and of course, the, this notion of credibility that comes with civil society organizations, folks that are from their own communities um, cannot be overstated as well. And all of your recommendations are really excellent to, to support and amplify that civil society work and I hope to see it come to fruition. So thank you so much for your intervention today. So for our fourth uh, civil society speaker today, thank you. We have um, Anthony Abi Zayed, who is joining us on behalf of Mentor Arabia, a regional nonprofit foundation headquartered in Lebanon since 2016 and covering 22 Arab countries. Today, Anthony will be speaking about the efficiency of the 4Z, for Generation Z program, which was developed by Mentor Arabia to target youth in collaboration with local actors and governmental entities to build their capacities and improve resilience as they face their ongoing challenges. So I believe Anthony may be with us in person, but if not, we do have a video as well. Um, so perhaps Sarah can let us know which route we'll be taking. I don't see Anthony here with us, uh, but I do have the video ready, so I would uh, I would play it, and maybe he can he can join a bit later. Wonderful, thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Anthony Abizaid, head of programs at Mentor Arabia. Mentor Arabia is a regional NGO that aims to empower children and youth in the Arab world. Uh, to prevent risky behaviors through capacity development, uh, awareness, sharing knowledge, and dissemination of knowledge and uh, strategic partnerships. Uh, I'm glad to be with you today and have a brief intervention on specific topics. However, first I would like to start by uh, a statement by UNODC, which is for every dollar spent on prevention at least 10 can be saved in future health, social, and crime costs. And here comes the importance of prevention, which is our main role, and specifically in the primary prevention. I would like to highlight on two types of intervention that we do at Mentor Arabia. First is the evidence-based uh, programs that we intervene uh, with this, pro this program in the Arab world. And I will take an example, Unplugged, which is a program that uh, we adopted it was developed by eu dab and UNODC, and we adopted it and uh, were able to implement this program in several arab countries like jordan palestine Sultanate of Oman, and portugal in lebanon and i would like to highlight also an evidence informed program that we build uh, usually based on specific requests uh, and i would like to take an example for z which is for generation z uh, this program is, uh, was developed by Mentor Arabia and uh, was implemented in Lebanon in addition to Jordan. And this program utilizes the best available research and practice knowledge to guide program design and implementation towards preventing youth from drug use and risky behaviors. Uh, our main aim from this program is to strengthen adolescent and youth implementation, uh, youth protection, 
capacities through the implementation of life skills empowerment and risk behaviors prevention activities. Uh, this program used the active learning and participatory training styles uh, during all delivered sessions. And we have some key messages that we would like always to disseminate uh, during this program. And they are all through interactive and engaging activities such as role play, teamwork, discussions, uh, quizzes, drawing, exhibitions, uh, challenges and others. Uh, these programs are always either evidence-based or evidence-informed are always a need to have partners to be to, to, to become alive and here is the importance of having ministries and civil societies uh, schools uh, local actors uh, to be able to implement these programs for evidence-based programs we were able to create partnerships with ministries like the Ministry of Education in Jordan, in Palestine, in the Summit of Oman, in Lebanon. In addition to local partners in these countries that supported us in the implementation. Let's take an example, Jordan. In Jordan, we were able to implement Unplug through the support of a local partner called the Royal Health Awareness Society. In addition to the Ministry of Education and sometimes in, with building partnerships with some private sector to support us in funding these programs to, to become alive and to have the sustainability as well. Uh, however, for example, in Lebanon for uh, 4Z, we had to build some partnerships with uh, schools and uh, this, programs, this program was mainly also supported by the Ministry of uh, Social Affairs uh, however, we were able to tailor this program to the needs coming from the schools. And this program is uh, very flexible. We were able to implement it all uh, in schools. However, we were able also to pick from uh, its sessions and combine it with other programs and implement it, uh, implementing it in, uh, in different situations. For example, in Jordan. During COVID-19, mainly we faced a lot of challenges. Uh, these challenges were like against our uh, coming against our belief because we believe that face-to-face -face inter face -face interventions are the most important interventions. However, we were forced to do uh, to do online interventions. Therefore, we work on developing platforms. Uh, and these platforms were interactive as well and implement uh, our programs through uh, through these platforms and having like using Zoom to be able to reach our audience and provide them with the best approach and uh, the best knowledge and the best practices. Uh, however, we were forced to adapt our programs to, to, to the situation that we had. Uh, as for the SDGs, Mainly, our programs target the SDGs uh, 3 and 4, the good health and well-being, and uh, quality education. As for the good health and well-being, we believe that prevention is essential. And prevention uh, can lead not only to prevent risky behaviors, but also for positive youth development, because we use, we use the, the empowerment methodology through empowering the life skills of our beneficiaries. And second, the quality education. We believe that we should add extracurricular activities with focus on life skills in, uh, in our, uh, in our uh, school curriculums. Uh, the importance of having prevention uh, through uh, a specific focus on life skills can lead us to reach the SDGs 3 and 4 in a great way. Thank you so much for letting me uh, be part of this amazing uh, conference and uh, thank you for your time. Thanks so much to Anthony for sending in his remarks.
really grateful for that video presentation, which I think, like our other presenters, showcased an excellent example of the importance of partnerships really across sectors, different stakeholders, um, and the importance of those types of partnerships to the success of programs. And it was also really interesting to, to hear Anthony speak about the tailoring of programs. Of course, they mentioned targeting Generation Z, but the diverse different types of programs, interventions, services that they offer um, that might be more suitable to, to some versus others and having that tailored customization, I think is always an advantage. So really great to hear from Anthony as well. So now we have reached the, the end of our four civil society speakers for today. I'd like to now be able to open the floor for questions, comments. I had encouraged folks up top to put them in the chat as they went through if they were so inclined. So perhaps Sarah, there are already some questions and comments that we can address, um, but if not welcome folks to put them in the, in the chat as well. Uh, no questions so far in the chat, but uh, please feel free to still post or to raise your hand in case you wish to take the floor. Yeah, absolutely. We do have that functionality available too. So if you'd like to orally ask your question or make your comment, that works as well. Um, so maybe I'll just give it a, a few um, seconds for if anyone wants to jump in before diving in with a question of my own. <laughs> Great, and thank you, Sarah, for putting us all on the screen. Wonderful. Okay, well, while we wait for those questions in the chat or, or raised hands, maybe I can start us off with a question for our panelists, uh, which really does build upon, I think, some of the remarks that have been shared, um, but thinking specifically about what needs to be done to accelerate the implementation of the 2030 agenda when it comes to drug-related issues. Um, 2030 isn't too far away. Uh, the years pass faster and faster. So I wonder if in your own regions, in your own work, if you have some thoughts around what is needed um, that maybe doesn't exist already or could be enhanced to get us where we need to be by 2030. So welcome any thoughts on that, um, including from our opening remark speakers as well, if, if you are so inclined. Thank you. And Sarah, do we still have Ernesto to put on the screen or, or maybe he's disconnected? And, and that's I why. couldn't find him currently, but okay. I'm keeping no most, most, uh, I keep looking in case he uh, he's able to reconnect. Yeah, no problem at all. Thanks. Please, Stacy, really go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, please. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Nasli, I think it's absolutely critical um, to ensure that people who are using drugs are on the platforms, um, specifically I'm talking about within, you know, um, not only South Africa, but as many all over the world, um, you know, that whole nothing about us without us. And, um, you know, this, this also encourages a better understanding. It fosters, you know, a healthier approach, I think, in all areas. Um, when given a platform, you know, for people, they, they know what they need. Um, you know, if I think about the rural context um, of South Africa, um, you know, the education levels are extremely low, um, you know, they're afraid to speak up and when they are developed um, and supported to be able to speak on these platforms and engage with various sectors it goes a long way to achieving the some of those sustainable development goals um, you know because people have a better understanding and I think that's absolutely critical um, in any context. Thank you. Thank you, Stacey. I think that's that's so important. And um, I think many of us can think of examples where well-intended efforts that were not undertaken with 
appropriate consultation and involvement with those groups actually led to unintended harms. And that is exactly the opposite of, of what we want to achieve. So it's so critical to be walking hand in hand and really being led by those groups that are most affected to be telling us what the, the path forward is. Thanks, Stacey. Jaya, did you unmute? Did you want to chime in on this or? <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Marilla. Thank you, everyone. Um, what I wanted to add to this, in order to foster the implementation of this uh, drug policies, uh, take West Africa, Nigeria, for instance, uh, I think there's a great need for the government to take into cognizance that this needs to be implemented into the law um, in collaboration with civil society, of course, so that civil society can also give them their own viewpoint so that they can be working towards an effective outcome in order to foster the SDG goals for 2030 so that despite whoever is in power as a president or whoever, even if they leave office, this will be a continuum, it will be a continuous process and it won't die with the regime. So thank you, that's my brief contribution. You know, so important as well. The area of drugs and drug policy is so dictated by the political wind. So getting those those gains into the legislation so that they can last the, the test of time is always so important, really critical point. And I see we do have a question in the audience. Is that right? A, a hand up? Oh, there's a question in the chat and a um, a hand up. Maybe starting with the hand up, if some if, if Femi is it, if you'd like to unmute and ask your question. You're welcome to. Thank you. Um, I want to add that uh, in Nigeria, we have uh, the National Drug Policy, which is called NDCMP, National Drug Control Master Plan. That is the official document, working document of the Nigerian government. This uh, master plan covers series of years. For instance, we have 2011 to 2015. We also have 2015 to 2019, but in year 2018, the civil society organization in Nigeria, uh, in partnership with UNODC and EU, the program was sponsored by the European Union. It is called response to crime and other related crime, uh, response to drug and other related crime in Nigeria. It was from October 2020 to It remains the official. Um, document, policy document of federal government of Nigeria on drug related matters. This document was uh, composed with the input of the civil society organization. In fact, as a matter of fact, in that, uh, in that document, there is a provision where we have a um, na, um, state drug control committee. For instance, we have like a 36 states in Nigeria. Uh, we have the interministerial committee. They are to implement that uh, National uh, Drug Control Master Plan in each state of the Federation, which I feel will also benefit other countries of the world to have an official document, just like the intervention that UNODC is having in Nigeria, they could also implement it across or other nations could also learn from that uh, aspect too. Thanks so much, Femi. It's great to know about that, that legislation or that policy making process as well. And it's inclusion of civil society and certainly complements what we've been hearing about Nigeria thus far today. So thank you for those remarks. And I, I see that we're short on time, but there was one question in the chat. I, I would be remiss not to address our only chat question. Uh, so I'll maybe poise that and then just make some closing remarks. Apologies if we run a minute or two over here, hopefully that's okay. Um, I believe this is a question from Morella because it's addressed to UNODC. And it's about asking how the UN agency, UNODC, is planning to deal with the policy crisis in Central African countries. Um, so if you'd like to, to speak to that, Morella, um, you're welcome to. Um, please go ahead. Oh, Morella, you're just uh, muted. You got it. Nasli, um, yeah, before jumping in on this white question, I just... Uh, would like to 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 echo uh, what Anthony had said, uh, responding to your first question: prevention, prevention, education. You know, the less we uh, we can have uh, issues on drug, the better it is. And uh, I think this is really the key to save life. 
to come back, uh, I, I, I noted this question and I will pass it on to our regional office because obviously he's not speaking uh, specifically about uh, the issue discussed today, but very wide range thing that I cannot help here. Thank you. Thank you, Morella, no problem at all. And I'm sure they'll be grateful to, to receive some information via email afterwards. So having closed the question and answer period, I'd like to just make a few closing remarks before ending the event. I personally really found today's event to be both informative and inspiring. I, I hope it's been helpful to all of you as we continue to work towards the achievement of the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda in, of course, the area of drugs and drug policy. And of course, it's been mentioned a couple of times here that drugs and drug policy are soon to be the focus of the international community as member states, international organizations and civil society gather for the 66th session of the Commission on Narcotic Drugs or CND this March in Vienna um, in what will be a, a larger in-person presence we expect than has been in the last couple of years with some virtual elements as well. I think it's really important to recall that in preparation for the midterm review of the 2019 ministerial declaration in 2024, this upcoming session of the CND will actually be adopting a modalities resolution to decide upon the format, the content, and the outcome of that midterm review to come next year. So just in closing, I thought I would, in alignment with the focus of today's event, give just a few short recommendations for member states that might be with us today specifically first to perhaps use the modalities resolution to ensure the meaningful participation of civil society in the midterm review, specifically via collaboration of both the New York NGOC and the NGOC, who have of course been involved in uh, convening civil society through the civil society task force in the past around reviews. In addition, given the importance of strong partnerships between civil society, member states, international organizations that we've really talked about today, I would say that it's important that meaningful participation of all of those relevant UN entities, including via the implementation task team of the UN system common position on drugs, be involved in that midterm review. Um, and that could be enshrined in the modalities resolution itself. I think such engagement across the UN system is really critical to improving coherence on drug policies that are grounded in human rights, health, development, and help us to achieve the SDGs. Just beyond participation in the actual midterm review, I think that meaningful involvement of civil society in UN entities, including the task team, would also extend and be imperative to the production of any sort of evaluation report of progress that's been made since 2019, and that should be accounted for in the modalities resolution. And finally, I invite member states to consider how that final review of the 2019 ministerial declaration in 2029 can be closely aligned with the assessment of progress made in the implementation of the SDGs, given the 2030 agenda will end just one year after that final review is set to take place. So to facilitate this, an outcome of the midterm review uh, next year could be a multi-year work plan of thematic intercessionals from 2024, 2028, given the significant success of this approach uh, for 2019 to 2023 in keeping key drug policy discussions high on the agenda of the CND. I think it would be great to see that continue. So at the New York NGOC, we really look forward to continuing our, our decades long track record of ensuring strong and visible civil society participation at the UN. And we're committed to strengthening our collaborative work with the VNGOC, UNODC, as well as other relevant UN entities. It's only through those strong partnerships that we can progress together in achieving the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda, including in the area of drugs and drug policy. So thank you all for attending. Allow me again, sincerely to thank our speakers, our co-sponsors, such an excellent event. For um, our speakers today, I wonder if you're willing to just hang back a moment so that we can get a photo together for social media. Um, but yeah, really grateful to everyone for being here. I think it was an excellent event. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'll clap thanks everyone. <laughs> thanks Natalie as well. <laughs> thanks and thanks for the photo. Well done, good one. And I think so.